Okay, so good morning everyone. Thank you for organizing this press conference. So I'm going to introduce uh, this, uh, the news about this, uh, this project, uh, IDA, which uh, is a coordination of scientists to work on planetary defense. And we have those two missions, DART by NASA and the project ERA by ESA, which hopefully will be approved at the next ministerial. So uh, the target, actually, of, uh, of these uh, missions is uh, Didymoon, which is a, or Didymos B, which is a satellite of a binary asteroid. Uh, the satellite is 160 meters in size, and now we have at least an image of what a 160 meter rock looks like. Because as you can see on this image, we have uh, an image of the asteroid Ryugu, which is currently visited by Hayabusa 2, which is an amazing mission that accomplished a lot of uh, successful operations, including two samplings, uh, deployment of rovers, uh, and many other things. And this is the first image of a carbonaceous asteroid that we have, so Ryugu, followed by, of course, Osiris Rex, we went to Bennu. And in particular, on this, uh, on this asteroid, you can see the boulder on the top, which is actually a south pole. It's 160 meters in size, which is the size of the target of DART and ERA. So you can see that uh, this is a very, very small object, because already Ryugu, one kilometer in a large diameter, is small, uh, relatively. So 160 meters in size is superbly small. So that's very uh, fascinating, and therefore this mission would be the first to go to a binary asteroid. We have about 15% of aster small asteroids that are binaries, like the Earth-Moon system, but in a small scale. So that will be the smallest uh, asteroid ever visited. And then, by that, the first full-scale cratering physics experiment at a scale of 160-meter rock and we don't know yet what can happen. And the first radar tomography, because on HERA there is, there is a radar that will probe the uh, subsurface and internal structure of an asteroid, something that has never been done before. So in the context of Hayabusa 2 and, and Osiris-Rex, uh, we have these two fascinating missions which send us absolutely fabulous images of two new worlds for us. Uh, and you can see their size, Rigo is 900 meters in size, as I said. Bennu is also is 500 meters, so smaller. But then with Didymos B, we go three times less in size. So uh, we know that uh, gravity has a role in the way these bodies behave, and therefore we'll go down in gravity, and therefore that will improve our understanding of how gravity uh, acts on such an asteroid, and in particular at the very low end, because under 60 meters means that the escape speed is only a few centimeters per second, so it's very, very, very small. Uh, the other thing which is interesting is that we know now that Bennu and Ryugu are both what we call top top shapes, so basically they are oblate spheroids with an equatorial bulge. And this is very characteristic, it was super, I mean, it was super surprising to have these two objects having almost exactly the same, the same shape. Uh, and in, these shapes are usually found for the primaries of binary asteroids. And you can see here on the left some radar models, uh, I mean, uh, shape models made by radar. Uh, of this kind of, uh, of object. We don't have yet a direct image of a primary of a binary. And uh, what's interesting is to see what Didymos A will look like. There are very specific characteristics of Bennu and Ryugu, and it will be interesting to see if Didymos A share these characteristics, which may mean that maybe Bennu and Ryugu had also a small satellite uh, before, because these top shapes are usually associated with a satellite. Or if Didymos A has a totally different characteristic, maybe there is a thing that tell us that a top shape can have or not a satellite based on these characteristics. So in the context of Osiris and Ayabusa 2, uh, um, DART and HERA will maybe feed some information to this mission to understand the past history of these two objects, which is absolutely fascinating. And finally, of course, we'll have the impact by DART, and uh, all our understanding of impact physics rely uh, uh, on the laboratory experiments, which are, are done on a um, centimeter size targets, so very small targets, and we don't understand yet how things scale with size. Well, now we have a new, a new data point, which was given by this uh, absolutely successful experiment by Hayabusa 2, by the small carrion impact, uh, which was a projectile of two kilograms that shot on the Ryugu surface at two kilometers per second and made a crater. And you can see on the left image, you have the, the surface before the cratering experiment. And on the right, you have the crater produced by the small carrion impactor. And it is much wider than we thought. Because, in fact, what we found is that the cohesion 
does not play a role to explain this large size of the crater. So even on such a low gravity objects like Ryugu, uh, one kilometer in size, apparently the gravity dominates uh, uh, the process of uh, impact cratering, which is a big surprise for us. So now the question is when we will shoot on a 160 meter size object, which is super small, will strengths of the material start to play a role or whether will gravity will also be the dominant effect? And this uh, knowledge is fundamental for planetary defense because if we want to deflect an object, the response of the body is very different if tr the strength dominates, is the most influential parameter, uh, or if the gravity is the influential parameter. And we have absolutely no knowledge on that for 160 meter size bodies. So this is absolutely interesting. And uh, the, I just, no, that's, uh, I think, the, the last... Uh, yeah, that's mine. Yeah, yeah, that's yours. So <laughs> that's basically what I wanted to say. We have a, very, a, a new information given by the Hayabusa 2 mission that a larger crater than expected was produced. So now we need to know for a small body, which is 160 meters in size, which is the size we are interested in for planetary defense, is also dominated by gravity or strength. Thank you. Yeah, and with that uh, perfect lead-in, so um, my name's Nancy Chabot. I'm at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I'm the coordination lead for the DART mission, um, which is a NASA mission that is going to demonstrate the technology of a kinetic impactor. Um, and so basically, you have a spacecraft come, come in. This is the kinetic impactor that's going to come in at very high speeds to an asteroid. And uh, it's going to impart this energy, which is going to nudge the asteroid, deflect it. It's not going to disrupt it. That's a very important distinction. The goal here is deflection, a small nudge, and this is going to change the asteroid's speed and path. And this is the sort of thing that you would want to do if something was on a collision course with the Earth and you wanted to deflect it. So it's a very um, straightforward kinetic impactor technology. Uh, DART is scheduled to launch in July of 2021, so not too far off, and the impact is scheduled for September of 2022 and everything with the mission is on course to meet those milestones. So we're going to take a little bit to talk about um, DART's mission target, Didymos, because Didymos is really the ideal target for this first planetary defense kinetic impactor demonstration mission. Uh, so Didymos, as we discussed, is a binary asteroid system. And it's important to say it's a near-Earth asteroid, but it's not on a course to collide with the Earth. So this asteroid is a, is a safe target. It's not on a course to collide with the Earth, but it's here in our near-Earth object space. Um, and so this makes it a good target for this first test for that region, but also more importantly is this binary nature of the system. And so Didymos is made up of these two asteroids, um, 160 meters smaller one goes around the 780 80 meter larger one runs every 12 hours or so. And so the DART spacecraft will come in at a very fast 6.6 .6 kilometers per second or uh, about 24,000 kilometers per hour. Um, speeding in a few days ahead of time, it's going to kick off a CubeSat called Lichia Cube. This is the light Italian CubeSat for imaging of asteroids. It's a contribution from the Italian Space Agency. And that, um, that CubeSat will, um, will be able to take some images of the impact event. Now, the DART spacecraft only has one instrument on it. It has a camera. It's the same camera or designed from the one that was on the New Horizons mission that imaged Pluto. And one of these things the cameras will do was see this asteroid as it gets closer, but it's actually an important technology that we call smart nav. It has to actually distinguish the larger asteroid from the smaller asteroid and target into the center of that smaller asteroid. And this is all done on board autonomously by using the images taken from this camera camera, and it won't actually be able to tell the difference between these two bodies because it's coming in so fast and they're so very small, and the separation between them is not very large until the last hour of the mission. So you won't actually be able to see this smaller object until the last hour of the mission, so you can see how crucial it is to have this technology to target the smaller asteroid. This is a technology that you would want for planetary defense in general if you were going to target a small asteroid out there because there would be uncertainties about where this object exactly was, so you would want a spacecraft that had the ability to target. 
get in and hit the asteroid head on. That said, we won't be able to uh, tell how effective the DART impact was because when this spacecraft comes in at 24,000 kilometers per hour, it will surely be destroyed. The camera on board will be destroyed. The CubeSat will get some pictures of the impact event, but it's speeding by at practically the same speed. So it really only has a few uh, minutes in order to capture this crucial data. So what really makes the Didymo system enabling is that Earth-based telescopes are going to make this crucial measurement of how much did we deflect this asteroid. And so the DART spacecraft will come in, it will hit Didymos B sort of head on. You can see the original orbit shown there in blue and then a highly exaggerated predicted new orbit uh, shown, shown in blue. So the original orbit's in white and then the new orbit that is highly exaggerated is shown in blue. And you can see that it's going to hit it nearly head on and it's going to change the orbit, deflect the orbit around the, how the smaller asteroid goes around the main asteroid. And we won't be able to tell this from the spacecraft, but the Earth-based telescopes are already making observations. We've had some great observations in 2019. We're going to have some more in uh, 2020, 2021, even in 2022, right before the impact to characterize what is this period of this binary system. And then we'll do that after the impact from the Earth-based telescopes as well. And we think this period change will be about 10 minutes, so about a 1% change in its orbit. We don't actually know the answer, which is why we have to do this experiment. Models predict very different values. Um, and the timing for the DART impact is in September of 2022 because this is when the distance between the Didymo system and Earth is minimized. So all these telescopes on Earth that already exist can take the highest quality data possible. And so this is why it's really ideal in this 2022 opportunity to target Didymos in order to make this mission in a cost effective, highly focused sort of way. And so DART is just one part of a much larger planetary defense strategy. There's all sorts of talks going on here at this conference, um, not just about DART and HERA, but about all these other activities that are going on internationally around the world. Um, it's important to assess what's out there. It's important to search, detect, and track these objects, characterize what they look like, their spectral characteristics, so you know what you're dealing with. There's a whole bunch of international working groups um, that, that meet in order to discuss this and then DART is one part of if something was on a course to collide with the earth how would we mitigate that what would we do about that so it's always important to put this into this much larger context this is not the only thing that we're doing by any means DART but DART is going to be the first mission that's launched by by sponsored by NASA's planetary defense coordination office so it is the first spacecraft mission that's going to go out there and do this planetary defense experiment in space which is so crucial so I, say, I was saying DART's this highly focused mission um, with the first planetary defense mission that NASA's doing. It's, uh, it's making this important first step because there's really so much we don't know on uh, asteroids of this size and what an impact would do, what sort of deflection is this going to cause, and demonstrating that technology. That said, um, the follow-on HERA mission and the AIDA collaboration that uh, we're going to talk about next can greatly enhance the planetary defense knowledge that we can get from this mission. And uh, so that's, I'll pass it off to my colleague. Thank you. That's a perfect transition. So I'm Michael Kuipers, the project scientist of the HERA mission. And before talking about HERA itself and how it will enhance <coughs> the outcome of the mission or our knowledge about the outcome of the mission and also the possibility to, to apply it to other objects, just a short reiteration of the AIDA collaboration. So it consists of the DART impactor we have just heard about that will impact Didymos in 22 and Keres Elysia, Italian cubes that with it. And important are also the uh, the observers, the scientific community that will observe the period change of the eclipsing binary due to the DART impact. And then HERA will come in, which is a rendezvous mission, and can then do a more detailed investigation of the asteroid pair. So the HERA con the concept is DART impacts in 2022. HERA, if approved at the Space 19 Plus Ministerial Conference this year, will be launched in 24 and arrive at the asteroid in early 27. The operational concept at the asteroid is, is largely borrowed from, from Rosetta, just moving everything closer in because the targets are much closer than for Rosetta. So one starts with 
10, 30, 20, 30, then 10, 20 kilometers orbits, getting successively closer in as one has more acquired more knowledge about the asteroid pair. Then Hera is also carrying two CubeSats, <coughs> which are so far the most advanced interplanetary CubeSats, two CubeSats, just 30 times 20 times 10 centimeter in size that have their own navigation capability and carry advanced instruments like one of them, a radar, to investigate the subsurface of the asteroids and the other, an imaging spectrometer from the, for the visible and near infrared to, to essentially look at the composition. And then there's a more experimental phase towards the end with very close flybys of the asteroids, especially the moon down to one kilometer. And the end of mission for all the three components is currently foreseen to land either on the primary or on the secondary. The details of that still have to be planned. <coughs> Before going now into the value of HERA for planetary defense, I need one conceptual view graph here. So what happens when DART impacts? One thing is that the momentum of the DART, in uh, of the DART spacecraft, when it impacts the asteroids, the spacecraft disappears and the momentum is transferred to the asteroid. <coughs> However, those things are not billiard balls, so there's a second effect, that the impactor creates a crater and material is ejected from the crater. And the reaction force of this reaction creates an additional momentum that, <coughs> sorry, that's ex uh, that the asteroid is exposed to. <coughs> and this additional momentum enhancement is something we want to, we want to measure. So we parameterize with the uh, momentum enhancement factor beta, which is defined in a way if we only have the billiard ball, thank you, billiard ball impact, and beta would be one if the effect of the ejector is as large as the direct impact momentum transfer beta would be two. So what we also see here, of course, this efficiency de um, depends also on the on the mass of on the mass of the moon. I mean, to convert the velocity change exerted on on the object to momentum exchange to momentum change, one needs to measure its mass. And as this is a small asteroid, so close to a much bigger object, so here the primary has a diameter of around uh, 800 meters, and Didi Moon is, the moon is something like a bit more than a kilometer away, and is only 160 meters in size, which corresponds to the mass being roughly 1% of the mass of the primary. This is difficult to, to detect even with the rendezvous spacecraft, so the normal radio science method, method by measuring the acceleration due to the asteroid of the spacecraft is difficult because the gravity of the primary is so dominant. We have, according to our simulations, we can do it with the onboard cameras of the spacecraft by measuring the wobble that you see in the lower image here of the primary due to the presence of the secondary. <coughs> in absolute units, this wobble is of the order is of the order of 10 meters, and we think we can measure it with an accuracy of a couple of decimeters. <clears throat> Another investigation which requires here is looking at the crater that was created by DART. It may or may not be seen by Lysia, but we think that it's most likely that Lysia will not be able to see through the dust onto the crater, and therefore the crater can only investigate it by HERA. And this example on the top shows, on the left side, a, a model of a crater formed in non-porous material, and on the right side, a crater formed in porous material. And one can see <coughs> that the porous material, in this case, creates a smaller crater because much of the incoming energy goes into compaction of the material instead of throwing out, uh, throwing out ejecta. And the effect on the, the momentum, uh, momentum enhancement factor as a function of porosity, one can see in the lower graph, where for very low porosity, the effect of the ejector coming out and the reaction force of the asteroid is even larger than the direct impact, while for very high porosity, it's negligible. So we have a factor of, and if one, of two and uh, more than two and even three or four, if you include other effects, uncertainty, how efficient the effect of that will be, and this factor will be largely reduced by, by the measurements from HERA. And finally, 
it's the first characterization of a binary asteroid, and it's a characterization of the target of the impact. So in addition to the scientific value that was pointed out by, by Patrick, it is also characterizing the asteroid that was impacted also helps us to understand, to, to understand the, the interaction between impact and asteroid and to scale the outcome to another asteroid should we ever need it for the real thing. Finally, the AIDA community is, is highly active. Just last week, we had a workshop, a three-day workshop in Rome, a meeting of the community, where we essentially discussed the status of the mission and the progress of the, of the diff different working groups that HERA and DART have separately, but they are covering uh, mostly the same topics, and they are coordinated due to a common coordination committee. The workshop attracted more than 100 participants from 18 countries. Most of them were, were either member states plus for the US from the DART representation and Japan, because we're also discussing a YAXA contribution. But there were also a few participants from other countries that are interested, like Uruguay and Taiwan. Thank you. Right, well, I'll shift gear a little bit and move on to, um, to the terrestrial planets. We're moving from over to the Space Science Program of ESA, and uh, there's a competition underway for what the next selected Space Science mission will be, and uh, we're down to three finalists, and one of those is a planetary mission going to Venus, and that's what I'll talk to you about now. Um, <clears throat> so, the, uh, the three terrestrial planets in our solar system, Mars, Venus, and Earth, were created around the same time. Uh, we understand uh, from the same sort of materials, but they've ended up quite different. It's like the Goldilocks story. One's ended up too cold, one's ended up too hot, and the other one's ended up too just right. But also, if you look at the geology of them, Mars has quite an ancient surface. You know, a lot of the active processes shaping the surface, you know, the, the active tectonics and volcanism, um, uh, stopped a long time ago as the, as the planet cooled off. That's, of course, one of the exciting things about looking at it today, is, is you see what terrestrial planets were like such a long time ago. Um, but on the other hand, Venus is almost certainly still alive today. It has a much younger surface. Um, and so it, it lets us look at a, a very Earth-like planet, an Earth-sized planet, um, with active geology and, and understand uh, how, how different that could be. For example, it doesn't have plate tectonic overturning the way we have it on Earth, but it, it may have similar kinds of, kinds of tectonics. So um, this is once again to emphasize that when they were created, the, the, the terrestrial planets would have had a you know, magma ocean phase and uh, thick atmospheres full of uh, carbon dioxide and steam. Um, and then at some point, they cooled off enough to allow uh, the, the steam to condense on, on the surface. Uh, we know that's the case on, on Earth and Mars, certainly. Um, and at that point on Earth, all that uh, that water on the surface uh, was able to lock out some of the CO2 from the atmosphere into carbonate rocks, and so that's what removed a lot of the CO2 from the atmosphere. And then um, uh, with plate tectonics and, and uh, exchange between the surface and the atmosphere, we ended up with, with uh, stabilization of the climate, uh, giving us the, the clement place we have today. Uh, on Mars, a lot of the CO2, a lot of the volatiles were lost to space or frozen into the subsurface. Um, partly because it was colder and further away from the sun. Uh, on Venus, we don't know yet. We've had many fewer missions, particularly in the last decades, to Venus, so we don't have the data to tell us. And the community is, is about 50-50 split between those who think that the, uh, the steam atmosphere had a chance to condense, so you would, have had, you would have had a liquid ocean, a liquid water ocean phase, or so a habitable phase. Um, uh, for perhaps even billions of years before then developing a runway greenhouse effect where the oceans evaporated and, and you end up with this uh, superheated uh, atmosphere which we see today. Um, it's also possible that the water never had a chance to condense. It was lost and due to solar wind scavenging um, while it was in the steam atmosphere phase. So uh, there's a lot we don't know about this nearest neighbor of ours, this Earth-like planet next door. Um, so, uh, when the space race started, Venus was the first planetary target um, after, after the Moon. So, uh, the first planetary flyby, the first planetary entry probe were at Venus, uh, because it's closer uh, than Mars. Also more mysterious, as it's shrouded in clouds. Um, and so, there was an initial uh, focus on Venus in the 60s and 70s. Uh, dozens of missions were launched there. There were lots of successful Russian landers, like this one 
shown on your screen. This is a, a, a Russian lander. Um, and because the surface temperature is 450 degrees centigrade, uh, our conventional electronics don't last there for very long. So you basically land with your electronics surrounded by insulation and last for as long as it takes for the heat to get into electronics. Um, and the most recent of those landers was in 1985. So in terms of in situ data, we don't, we don't have that, that much. Um, but our knowledge of the global uh, geography comes uh, and, and geology comes almost entirely from this mission, the Magellan Radar Mapper mission, uh, launched in 1989, which gave us a global radar map, um, revealing volcanoes, like what you see in the bottom of your screen, and lava flows, and tectonic features. Um, but at the same time, some very unearth-like features. So if you look at the distribution of craters, which tells you how old a surface is, um, that gives evidence, first of all, that the surface is relatively young, and also that it doesn't appear to have the same kind of plate overturning tectonics which, uh, which the Earth has. But many of the questions we'd really like to know are, are limited by the spatial resolution of those maps, which is about 100 meters at, at best. And um, it turns out radar technology has come a long way since the 1980s when that has been designed. Um, and, and we can get much better performance now and we can really address some of these questions. The other thing to point out about Magellan is that we got effectively a single global uh, radar map showing all these interesting features, but we don't know uh, whether they're active today, you know, what's going on exactly today. So um, going back and having repeat observations would help us determine the rates of activity and the styles of activity we see today. Um, and more, uh, more emphasis on activity was given by the Venus Express mission, which was an ESA mission at Venus um, from 2005 to 2015. Um, and although it was largely focused on the atmosphere, there were three results which really hinted at active uh, volcanism uh, today. So one is uh, there's, there's sulfur dioxide in the upper atmosphere, which um, seemed to vary by over a factor of 10 uh, through the life of the mission. Sort of strong rises, rapid rises, followed by slow decreases, which is exactly what you'd expect if there were injections into the atmosphere. Um, and there's also some hints of, um, of temperature changes around volcanoes uh, on the surface. Uh, it's a very difficult measurement to make because you're peering through the clouds and the instruments weren't designed for that, but um, we'd love to go back and, and try to uh, go back with optimized instruments. Um, I should mention for completeness, there is a current uh, mission at Venus, which is the Akatsuki mission from Japan. Uh, it's focused mostly on meteorology, so it doesn't inform this, this debate about the surface that much. So. We have a proposed Venus orbiter called Envision, um, which is currently under study. It's entering phase A study uh, as one of three finalists. And it, uh, the, that final down selection will be made in 2021, mid 2021. We're aiming for a launch in 2032. Uh, and then science phase would be over the next sort of half decade after that. Um, and so the science themes really uh, are around how geologically active is Venus today, so that's volcanism, tectonism, uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, what does the ge geological record tell us about the surface history? And also, what are all those interactions between the surface and, and the atmosphere, sort of outgassing of volatiles, things like that, SO2 story. So here's a visualization to, to give you a, a hint as to what it might look like. So here are radar booms unfolding. This, there's a sort of a synthetic aperture radar which gives you your high resolution imaging. Um, there's a, this long antenna is a much longer wavelength. That's a subsurface sounding radar so we can see sort of three dimensional structures. Um, and then this is supposed to sh give you a hint of what the existing radar maps look like. And we can, we can get much higher resolution, much higher spatial resolution, but also by using things like polarimetry to really differentiate between different surface types um, to give us a much more complete and, and uh, an, an accurate picture of, of the geology today. Um, so it's quite a focused payload. We have an imaging radar, which can go down to resolutions uh, probably about 20 times higher spatial resolution than the existing maps we have. Um, potentially we can also look for centimeter scale change detections. You know, after, uh, after earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, you often see in press releases, if you look at the geophysical press, which I hope you do, uh, you'll see these uh, interference fringe maps showing you the, the surface movement after an earthquake, and we'd, we'd be able to do the same at Venus through the clouds, because radar, of course, sees through clouds. 
Um, and that'd be complemented by some spectrometry where we can uh, really try to track the gases coming out of volcanoes, those surface atmosphere interactions. Um, I, I mentioned the subsurface sounder to look below the surface, and, and that's complemented by new gravity maps to look at crustal thickness, um, spin rate changes. Um, this is you know, over a decade from launch, so, so many of these design details uh, will change between now and launch. Um, and, and in particular, um, uh, we have a, uh, a strong contribution in this mission from NASA. So NASA has, uh, has a mission enabling uh, contribution to this, which will be the, the radar instrument, the main radar instrument will be uh, NASA-led with a joint NASA-Europe science team. So we're very excited to take advantage of their, their expertise in building uh, planetary radars and um, we look forward to working on this mission. Um, here are some contacts if you want to talk to any of us, and there's more sort of videos and images available on the website to show on your screen. So then, uh, from Venus back to the Earth, down to Mars, and back to the uh, back to the Earth again. Um, so I'm Kelly Haler. I'm a, a systems engineer on the Mars Sample Return Orbiter, and I'm going to give an overview of uh, what Mars Sample Return is and where we are currently uh, standing and why all the excitement actually is building up at the moment. So Mars Sample Return is not a single mission. It's a, what we call a campaign. It's existing out of uh, three uh, missions, mission elements that go into space, and the fourth element, which is uh, the sample return facility here on Earth. So the first mission actually is already about to launch next year, which is the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, this will be doing in-situ in science, but also uh, caching the samples already, uh, so that we need to can go there and pick them up already, and that they're carefully selected samples. Uh, the second uh, two missions will be launched more or less about the same time. We're currently planning for 2026, which is the sample retrieval lander uh, and the Earth return orbiter. So I'll just show on the next slide a short animation explaining a bit how these missions uh, work together. So this is the 2020 uh, mission, the sample caching rover will go there and it will carefully select samples and put them on the surface. Then in 2026 the two other missions will launch about the same time. So uh, we will land there, a, a sample fetch rover will go and pick up the samples that have been cached previously by the 2020 mission and bring it back to the uh, surface platform where they will be loaded into the ascent vehicle. These will be launched back into an orbit around Mars and then the Earth return orbiter will cache this sample uh, canister which is like a ball of about 25 centimeters. Uh, it will optically detect it, then cache it, rendezvous with it, and return them back to Earth uh, into the Utah desert, uh, into the sample uh, receiving facility, where then the scientists can do all the science they, they want to do that we cannot do in situ. So I'll just give a little bit more details about each of the different elements and what the current uh, status of them is. So as I said, uh, it's actually already starting next year uh, with the launch of uh, M2020. Uh, this means that also the landing site has been selected, it will go to Jezera Crater, which is good for us because we know exactly also what we will be uh, designing towards uh, and we'll be understanding the terrain also much better because we have a rover there. It's worthwhile pointing out that the rover is a similar size to Curiosity and it also has a, an RTG on board so it will not be solar powered so it w might well be or um, we think it will probably still be alive by the time we're going to uh, send also the lander there, so it's likely that we'll have two rovers on the surface there uh, able to bring the samples back to the, to the surface platform. So then the sample retrieving uh, lander, which is a, a NASA-led element, uh, is, uh, is going to land there and currently they're doing different trade studies uh, within, uh, within JPL, looking at the sky, tra uh, sky train type of landing as well as more a legged power descent uh, lander. Uh, so this will all be uh, NASA-led and also the Mars Ascent vehicle. There's still trade-off studies going on if it will be a solid fuel, two-stage rocket or a, a hybrid single-stage rocket. Uh, and then uh, we have the rover, which was European, I'll talk about that in a minute. And also on the surface platform there will be a robotic arm that will be there to take the samples from, uh, from the sample fetch rover and, and put them onto the surface lander, which would be a European uh, contribution. 
for that, uh, for the sample transfer arm also, there's currently technology activities ongoing and we're breadboarding this. So then uh, for the sample fetch rover, I think if you can just... Uh, the sample fetch rover, uh, also currently uh, we already uh, have contracts running with industry. It's an ESA provided element. It's, a lot of the technology will be based on the ExoMars uh, rover, but the rover will be smaller. It's about two thirds of the size of the, the MER rovers. Uh, as you can see, the locomotion system is different because we had to make everything smaller, so it has only four wheels instead of six. But it will also be very exciting because these will be shape memory alloy wheels, which actually are provided uh, by NASA. As you can see, we are collaborating very closely and, and trying to optimize everything as much as possible with the technologies that are there between uh, both NASA and ESA. So this rover will go pick up the samples and bring it back to the, to the, surface, uh, to the surface lander. So then, uh, then there's still the Earth return orbiter left. Uh, also for this one, we're actually going full speed ahead. Uh, this is a, a hybrid orbiter. It has both chemical propulsion and electrical propulsion and is all designed to make the mission as flexible as possible to extend the surface timeline as much as possible uh, and, and to have flexibility in the, in the return as well. Uh, for this one, we have currently uh, what we call the phase B1s running, so we're going towards the end of this year into the, the, the requirements, uh, system requirements review. And actually also worthwhile pointing out that uh, we already have also now the ITTs, the invitation to tender running, for uh, implementation phase, so that would be the full contract for, uh, for building this uh, spacecraft. And we're expecting the proposals from our industry back in November. And this is all done to make sure that as soon as any money or the funding is secured, we can go ahead straight away because a launch in 2026 means we have to, we have to be, stay on schedule. So we are doing everything we can to make sure that we will be ready um, on time. So on site in the Earth return orbiting, uh, orbiter, there's also, uh, of course, an important part, which is the part uh, that's actually sitting on the top. Well, Uh, yeah, the one on the, on the bottom on the, on the left, which is the, the part that will capture the sample. Important technology is also that we do the containment there to make sure that no parts of this Martian sample can escape from, uh, from the canister and the Earth entry vehicle. And that uh, sort of backpack that will be on the orbiter is NASA provided again. So, uh, yeah, as I said, we are going full steam ahead. Uh, NASA, for example, already in July had a big acquisition meeting. They've uh, then agreed at the highest NASA level the agreement between uh, the roles between uh, the ESA and NASA or confirmed that they're okay with that and also uh, to share the road between the different NASA centers. Uh, as I said, uh, in ESA, we are uh, planning to go ahead with the rover contract as well as the, the Earth return orbiter as soon uh, as there would be money coming from the Ministerial Council. So in November at the Ministerial Council, there's a proposal to fund the Mars sample return mission all the way up to the next Ministerial Council to go ahead uh, for on the European side with the orbiter, the rover and the robotic arm. Uh, and in the meantime, we are collaborating uh, on making the joint management implementation plan and a memorandum of understanding that uh, we hope will be signed uh, already sometime in the February-March time frame next year. And then I hope in 10 years' time we'll be sitting at a press briefing where you see a video from the sample fetch rover looking still at the Mars 2020 rover still alive that will be launching the samples back into Mars orbit so that we can return them to Earth. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so uh, sorry we had technical issues during the live streaming, but we'll put the recorded version online uh, right after the briefing. So we'll take questions now. And before you ask your questions, please state your name and affiliation. Yes, Hans Arthur Masiska. I'm writing for Heiser Online Germany. Just one quick question about what's the mass of the impact of, da of the DART mission? The mass and may, may the fuel be left, which could uh, influence the, the effect of the impact, or is it uh, an electrical propulsion? Uh, propul 
so the uh, the mass at the time of impact is roughly 650 kilograms. I mean, that'll depend on specifically which correction maneuvers are done on board then. You know, there will be uh, a bit of fuel because, you know, you always carry more than you need and sort of in the baseline there. So, you know, we, we'll have a good handle on what that mass is, though, when we do the impact, but 650. Um, kilograms is the is the nominal one. Um, we do have the next C ion propulsion engine that we're going to demonstrate, but during the actual impact, we won't be using it. It'll just be a ballistic uh, chemical trajectory. Um, right. Uh, we have some online questions, Adriana. Yes. Um, how well do we know the current uh, orbital parameters of Didy Moon around its main? And could we even detect a change after the DART mission collision and uh, calculate it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, right? So we know a lot about the Didymos system. People have been looking at it with Earth-based telescopes for decades. Um, so there's, and we have some good radar observations even of it as well, um, of the system and of the primary. Um, and uh, one of the things that I should have mentioned, the reason that we know so much about the period of the smaller one going around the larger one is because it is this eclipsing binary system. So as you view this system from a telescope on the Earth, its brightness changes as the moon passes in front of or behind to the main asteroid. And so this is how we can use the Earth-based telescopes to very, very accurately get that period. So right now it's 11 hours and 52 minutes, plus or minus some amount, and we know that uh, that very precisely. Now that said, when you don't look at it for a while, because you can't see Didymos, the Didymos system all the time from the Earth, because you can't see everything all of the time, um, the uncertainty that you have will, will build up over time, right? So at some point you, you aren't really sure where that moon is around the main object. So you need to use your telescopes and then look at it again. Once you look at it again, you understand very well where it is. And so the telescopes are very important for us understanding where the moon is right before DART's impact. And so we'll actually be using the telescopes months before the impact to verify we understand where the smaller moon is. But then we know its period very very precisely, and uh, the impact is um, required to make at least a 73 second change in that orbital period, but the models and especially some of these surprising results from Hayabusa 2 and the impact, we're thinking 10, tens of minutes or something like that. So it should be a very easy measurement to make. So, uh, so we know a lot about the system and we're gonna know even more with telescopes in the coming years. And, um, and then after the fact, the, the change that we'll make will be easily measured from the Earth base assets. Uh, one more online question. Um, what, be, oh, sorry. Uh, what will be the mission duration for the, uh, for the mission? And could the mission make the map of the entire Venus? Uh, so we'll take these questions one at a time. The mission duration, we're currently the nominal science mission would be about two and a half years. Um, but we hope to arrive with plenty of fuel, so uh, once everyone sees how the exciting science results coming back, and then as, as is usual for these missions, we can make the case for a mission extension. Um, as to whether we would uh, get a global map, to some extent we have already an idea about the global, uh, we have a global map of Venus at low resolution, and so what we'd really like to do is focus on particular areas of interest. So, about 10% uh, of Venus is highland areas, a bit like Earth's continents, where we expect the oldest crust to be. They're highly fractured, highly textured, and we don't know why and, and what the history of those regions are. So we've got a particular focus on those regions. It's not just the highlands, there's also certain volcanoes and certain really long channels. So these, there are these channels which snake across Venus like river channels for 5,000 kilometers is, is the longest one. Um, so uh, they may have been covered by lava. So there's lots of targets, but uh, we'd like to focus on those. Uh, so instead of getting a global map, we'll try to focus on those and repeat, image them repeatedly to look for change detection and detect current geological activity. Okay. Um, what new technologies uh, could be used to make data more accessible? Uh, she said, I love the quick map that NASA has for LRO and the messenger missions, so it will be great uh, if uh, ESA will do something similar. Is that for all of us? <laughs> I think that I was think a so. Venus question. I mean, uh, <laughs> so I, think, like... I think with every mission, uh, we, are, we are all keen to get the data used by as many people as possible. So in addition to taking the data, and analyzing it ourselves, not only does all the data get publicly archived on 
you know, the, the planetary data system, the planetary science archive, but there's also a lot of effort going into tools to make them usable, you know, Google Maps type interfaces so that you know, even non-experts can go in and navigate and, and then increasingly also make suggestions for, for follow-up observations, which, which the public would like to have image, and so we're working on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, all of NASA data, DART, in mission included, will be publicly available on the planetary data system. We'll be archiving some of the key telescope data sets as well because they are so crucial for the mission success. Uh, the same is forcing to apply, to apply for HERA. The data will be made public practically immediately. And also concerning the tools, uh, the planetary, ESA's planetary science archive is working on creating new, new and improved tools, essentially for your yeah, data visualization, for easier data analysis, and so on. Yeah, uh, Thomas Schumann, I'm a freelance, freelance journalist from Denmark, and that's also a Venus question I have. Um, this uh, radio um, instrument on the Envision spacecraft, would it be able to detect if there are any ongoing volcanic eruptions on, uh, on the surface? So we got, because we're so interested in volcanic activity, there are a lot of different ways, there are a lot of different ways we have of, of looking for volcanic activity. Uh, one is the infrared emissions from the surface, so you do have thermally emitted photons from the surface reaching space. They bounce a lot through the cloud layer, so it's very, it's very uh, spatially scattered, so we don't have a good spatial resolution, but we can see the, the increased uh, emission if, if there's a, like a lava lake or outpouring or something like that. So that's one, looking for the thermal emission. The next is looking for changes in the surface. You know, you look at the shape of a lava flow, and then if it's changed the next time you image it, that's why we're so keen on taking repeated imagery. And you know, we can get right down to resolutions below 10 meters per pixel. Um, and the, uh, the third thing is then looking at the interferograms. Uh, so by looking at, at the phase information of the radar reflections and comparing that on repeated passes, you can see changes in surface height over quite large areas, right down at the you know, centimeter level. Um, so for example, there's some wonderful uh, animations online uh, of Etna. You can, you can see how the whole flanks of the volcano expand as the magma chain fills up. And then when there's an eruption, the whole thing sort of deflates like a souffle. But you know, when, when, the, when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when an eruption occurs. And so we can do that even through the thick cloud layer on, on Venus. So, that's, so that we've got a whole suite of ways of looking for active volcanoes. Just a follow-up question to the availability of the data that somehow contradicts to the policy of this conference where there, is, where there are a lot of restrictions and no papers available. So what's the reason for that? I, I will let the uh, conference people who are the press officers take that. I mean, I'd suggest there's a, di there's a difference between the data them themselves uh, and, and sometimes the scientific analyses of the data. So we don't rush out with scientific conclusions like, hey, there's a, you know, there's, we've discovered a rock which looks like a badger on Mars, because then people would be all over it saying, hey, badgers on Mars are announced. You may think this is a far-flung example, but it's not too far from certain, certain things which have been said. Um, and and there's, a very, there's a peer review process which is very important in, in, in just the validation of scientific conclusions. And so by the time the scientific analysis has been performed, then, then some of the embargoes are, are to protect that side of things. But on both sides of the Atlantic, certainly uh, the agencies recognize the need to get uh, data out quickly and increasingly you're seeing image data you know for example Mars rovers and and you know some of, some of the missions we're talking about today release their imagery in near real time so those are available to the public um, another reason is that you know for us to then get all the geometry information so that you don't just have the image but you also have some maps as to where it is you know what's the latitude and longitude that takes time to create so that's another reason why uh, the data are sometimes not available in real time that's a personal take, so conference can come. More online questions? Um, does Earth return orbiter has any margins for science instruments of its own? I, I think, uh, well, the whole approach that was taken uh, last year was to do a lean Mars sample return mission, just to, to, get, uh, to get it within a reasonable or an achievable budget. Uh, uh, so for now, uh, we don't consider any uh, any additional payload. 
and as to see what margins there are available. I, it's currently too early to say we want to be on the conservative side to make sure everything everything fits basically. Okay. And another one, uh, how are you going to ensure that sample fetch rover lands close enough to Mars 2020? And could it uh, do more science after fulfilling its main mission of fetching the samples? Okay, so the, the sample fetch rover will be uh, landing with the same technology as the sky crane, so that would be like a sort of landing error ellipse of 10 kilometers. Uh, currently, there's also a trade off still ongoing, and in the current design, there, is, uh, the, there are extra tanks on board the sample, uh, the sample return lander to do potentially a divert maneuver. So you could uh, you could adjust it still, and also when it's going uh, when it's going through the atmosphere, it's doing a, a guided entry, which is already sort of limiting this uh, this approach. Uh, so that's uh, the first part of the question, and the second part was if it can do more more science or more uh, afterwards. Uh, again, this sample fetch rover is is only two thirds of the size of the Mer rover, and it's really designed for a uh, long traverse to make sure it will get to the different samples and back. Uh, so it's really focusing on that and it's currently being quite squeezed in, in available resources so again it's not really foreseen to put scientific payloads uh, on there purely for science and currently it's designed that we would uh, land at the end of the global uh, dust storm and would survive all the way up to the next dust storm uh, when we uh, would put the samples in there so also after that it's a, it's a solar powered uh, rover so uh, we don't expect that it will have a much long, uh, a much longer lifetime necessarily there, or it's not. It's currently not being uh, further considered. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we'll conclude today's uh, press briefing. Thank you to all the presenters and everyone who is present here and online, and uh, join us tomorrow at the same time uh, for the fourth press briefing. Thank you.